years ago, I was teaching a Bible class, had 85 students in this Bible class, uh, maybe 85 here today, I'm not sure. But uh, we had 85 students in this Bible class, most of whom members of churches of Christ. And I asked this question. I said, if you were to die today or if Jesus were to come, would you go to A, heaven, B, hell, C, I do not know, or D, neither heaven or hell? Uh, Guess what the number one answer was in that Bible class? Say it again, Bill. Heaven. Hopefully. But that wasn't the number one answer. C. I'm not sure. I don't know. Three in that Bible class of 85 students said, neither heaven or hell. If Jesus were to come, I wouldn't go to heaven. I wouldn't go to hell. Frankly, I don't understand that answer, but three of them said neither heaven or hell. Eleven in that Bible class were completely honest. Eleven said, we're lost. We we don't have any hope. Uh, We're hell bound. Thirty-one said, praise God, we're going to heaven. Heaven is my home. But 40 students in that Bible class said, I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, I want to start this Bible class by asking you the very same question. If you were to die today, or if Jesus were to come today, and wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus came today? You ever pray about that? Let me encourage you to put that on your prayer list. I tell you what I want, folks. I want Jesus to come in my lifetime. See, it is the last recorded prayer in the Bible. Revelation 22 and verse 20, even so come, Lord Jesus. So if Jesus were to come today, would you go to A, heaven, B, hell, C, I do not know, or D, neither heaven or hell? Let me tell you what some of you are thinking. I'm not sure. You know, I want to go to heaven. I I, I mean, I, I, I really want to be saved, but I just don't know. And maybe that's the devil that's placed those doubts in your heart. Or maybe you've maybe you've lived in a in a way that you have a reason to doubt. And we don't want you to leave with doubts. We don't want you to leave discouraged. We don't want you to leave depressed. We want you to leave with hope. Question, what is hope? You know, Scripture says, we've been talking about it uh, this weekend at Faith Builders. Ephesians 4, verse 4, there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. What is hope? Do you have hope? of salvation? Are you going to heaven? Do you have any hope? Uh, Paul talks about the hope of eternal life, Titus 1 and verse 2. Do you have hope? Well, the word hope carries with it at least two ideas. Number one, desire is something you really, really want. And number two, expectation is something you really, really expect. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. You probably would never ever say, I hope to get sick. Is there anybody in this class who would say, man, I hope to catch the virus? Well, you wouldn't say, I hope to catch the virus. Now, you might expect to get sick. You may may have been exposed to sickness, but you don't want to get sick. You probably would never ever say, I hope to get fired. Do you hope to get fired, laid off, kicked out? Now, you may expect to get fired. I mean, you may have disappointed your boss messed up at work, you may expect to get fired, but you don't want to get fired. On the other side of the coin, you probably would never ever say, I hope to be a billionaire. Do you hope to be a billionaire? You might want to be a billionaire, but you probably down deep don't expect to be a billionaire. You probably would never ever say, I hope to be the president of the United States. Do you hope to be the president? Uh, There's a lady in this uh, class. She's from Tennessee. She's been in kind of state politics. And I I wish, I could not say I hope, but I wish that she would run for president. I'd vote for her, Miss Sheila. But you probably wouldn't say I hope to be the president. Uh, you, You might desire that, 
You might want that, but down deep you probably don't expect that. See, hope is desire coupled with expectation. Now, I, I, I know you want to go to heaven. You, you wouldn't be in Bible class on a Sunday morning if you did not want to go to heaven. So I know you want to go to heaven, but honestly, by the grace of God, by the blood of Jesus, do you expect to go to heaven? Is heaven really your home? Well, that's what I want to talk to you about for a few minutes in this class. I want to talk to you about home, about home. Some of us might say, we're going home today. We're going back to Tennessee. Tennessee ain't home. Home is in heaven. I want to ask you to open your Bibles to John chapter 14. Uh, this weekend, we've been focused on John chapter 17, uh, Jesus prayed for unity, the entire faith builders workshop on unity. He prayed that we would all be one as he and the Father are one. And so we've been focused on John chapter 17. Well, this morning in Bible class, I want us to back up about three chapters to John chapter 14. John 14, and we'll start in verse 1. Now, you've heard it many, many times, but I want you to listen to it as though you've never heard it, okay? John 14, let's start in verse 1. Jesus said... Let not your heart be troubled. Don't, don't, don't be discouraged. Uh, don't be depressed. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many. Now, I know that one Bible says, in my Father's house are many rooms, right? Right? Maybe your, your Bible says rooms. Folks, I have a room at 106 Spyglass Way, Hendersonville, Tennessee. I don't want another room. I want a mansion. What about you? <laughs> In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Tell you what let's do. Uh, you know, in Churches of Christ, we count people every Sunday. Let's get a Bible count as we get started this morning. May I see your Bible, please? Just raise it up. Wow, you guys have been trained. That's all awesome. Very good. I want you to take the Bible and just kind of hold it in your hands. We call it the Bible. It's a big book, right? How many books in the Bible? Talk to me. 66, right? 39 in the old, 27 in the new. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. How many? 1,189. What's it all about? Sometimes I like to say the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Let me give you a one-word summary of this big book. Let me sum it up with one word, Jesus. This book, your, your book that you hold in your hand, your device. You know, sometimes I say, uh, open up your Bibles and all of these lights come on, right? That's the time in which we live. But your Bible is summed up by one word, Jesus. Three facts about Jesus in this book. Fact number one, from Genesis through Malachi. That's Old Testament. The implication is Jesus is coming. Uh, many prophets of old, people like Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, the psalmist, predicted the coming of Jesus Christ. The Messiah is coming. That's Old Testament. Fact number two, from Matthew 1 through Acts 1, the implication is Jesus is here. He's among us. Look at him. We can see him. We can touch him. We can hear him. God became human flesh and lived among us, right? That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus, God is here. Fact number three, from Acts 1 verse 11 through Revelation 22, 21, the implication is Jesus will come again. So Old Testament, he's coming, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's among us. He's here. Acts 1, verse 11 through Revelation 22, 21, the rest of the Bible, he is coming again. And that third implied fact, 
The fact that our Lord is coming again is the fact that Jesus is talking about here in John 14 when he said, hey, don't be bothered. Don't be discouraged. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'd go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself that where I am, you can be there too. Confession time. Sometimes I do not think like it talk like it or treat others like it. But if I know my heart more than anything in the world, I, I want to go to heaven. What about you? I, I, I really want to go to heaven. And, and uh, let me just tell you why. Let me share with you some of the reasons why I want to go to heaven in the first place. I want to go to heaven because heaven is a real place. Have you ever heard a preacher say something like, uh, heaven is a prepared place for whom? Yeah, you've heard that, right? Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Uh, preachers make that statement. I believe that's a true statement. It's not true because we preachers make it. It's true because that's exactly what Jesus implied. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself. Indeed, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Imagine, you could go to any place on earth. I'm going to pay for it. Your hotel bill, uh, your transportation. I I'm going to get you a rental car. I'm going to buy all of your food. Where would you go? Alan? Alan and I share the same name. And where would you go? If you could go to any place on earth, Hawaii. Have you ever been? Been there twice. Been twice to Hawaii. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. What about the rest of you? Where, where would you go, Bob? Australia. Austra I've never been to Australia. Have you been? Never been there. Like to go to Australia. I, I've been to some neat places. I've been to, I've been to New York City, and I've seen the tall skyscrapers there. Niagara Falls. I, I've seen the power of those falls. H have you ever been to the Grand Canyon? Many of you have that awesome hole in the ground. I've been to Alaska. I've seen the icebergs there. been to Jamaica. I've seen the white sandy beaches of Montego Bay. I've been to the Bahamas. I've seen the tall palm trees of the Bahamas. I've been to India. I've been to Russia. I've, I've looked into the eyes of the Indian and the Russian children. I've been to the land of... It. You ever been to Israel, Brandon? Have you ever been to Israel? Passing through, okay. Uh, Brandon is a world traveler one of our speakers, and uh, I've been to Israel three times. I've taken uh, three boat rides across the sea. Ken, have you ever been to Israel? Uh, let me encourage you to go. It's a faith builder. You talk about faith builders, it's a faith building trip. I I've taken a boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful body of water there in the land of Israel, about 13 miles long, about eight miles across. I've been to the city of Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born. I've been to the city of Jerusalem, the place where our Lord died. But can you imagine? The place called heaven? I heard about a little girl that was born blind. She could not see. And yet when she was about 12 years old, very successful surgery was done on her eyes. Very successful but serious surgery. And a few days later when the bandages were removed, she could see for the very first time. And she looked out the window of her hospital room and she saw the trees and the flowers and the birds she looked into the background. She saw the snow-capped mountains of the Rockies, and she turned to her mother, and she said, Mama, Mama, it's so incredible. It's so beautiful. Why didn't you tell me? It was so beautiful. And the mother said, Honey, I tried. I really tried, but I couldn't. I, I couldn't. And I don't know. Maybe, you know, that's maybe the way it's going to be in heaven. Here we are, the first day in heaven, and we're just kind of walking around with our spiritual jaws open, and, and we're looking at the majesty and the beauty of God's city. And then we see John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one that wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John, the one that wrote Revelation. We go up to John and we say, John, it's so incredible. Why didn't you tell me it was so beautiful? And I don't know, maybe John will have to say, well, brother, I tried, tried. I really tried, but I couldn't because the human language is in poverty to adequately describe the beauty and the majesty and the glory of God's place called heaven. 
See, heaven is a real place. It's kind of like Puyallup. It's kind of like Seattle. It's kind of like Tacoma. It's, it's, not a, it's not a physical place, but it is a real place, a spiritual place, a place prepared for prepared people. Let me give you another reason why I want to go to heaven. Why do you want to go to heaven? I'll tell you why I want to go. It's not just a place. It is a It's permanent. It's permanent. I don't want to forget about those sitting up in the balcony. Glad to have you today in Bible class. I want to go to heaven because it's a permanent place. Do me a favor. Look around this room. Oh, go ahead, folks. Look around. I promise I won't leave. <laughs> I'll stay right here. <laughs> what do you see? Tell me some things you see. Y'all do talk out in Bible class on Sunday morning, right? You see, you see bodies, right? People. What else do you see? Say it again. Family. Family. That's what our, our brother Bill said. Family. What else do you see? You see bodies. Okay. You see souls. Okay. Uh, I, there's, there's a soul in this body, okay? I'm, I'm not sure I would say I've, I've seen a soul. I, I guess we can see souls spirit, through spiritual eyes, right? Physically, what do we see? Well, we see chairs, right? An air conditioner. Man, two weeks ago, we heard it was 110 up here. So I thought, you know, I, I need to prepare for this. And I, and I kind of prepared for the hot weather. And I got here on Wednesday, and it was about 70 degrees. And the last three days, it's been, what, 70, 75. Beautiful weather up here. But, but, but you have an air conditioner. You have furniture. Uh, you, you look around, you see uh, flowers. Bodies, do you realize that everything you see is temporary? You go out into the parking lot, maybe you look into a distance, you see buildings, cars. Everything you see is temporary. In fact, didn't Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we don't look for the things that we see, we look for the unseen. For the things that we see are what? Temporal? They're just temporary, folks. Heaven is not temporary. It's forever and forever and forever. Jesus said that he will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world, and these shall go away into everlasting life. Think about the words everlasting. Eternal. Permanent. Hard for me to understand because everything that I do, there's a starting time, there's a stopping time. Is there a stopping time to this Bible class? <laughs> what time do we stop, Bob? When, when, you ring, when the bell rings, right? And, and you just thought we didn't believe in instrumental music, right? <laughs> we, we have bell ringers in the church. What time is the bell going to ring? 10.45, okay? There's a starting time, and there's a stopping time, right? Joe Wells doesn't know that. <laughs> Joe's preaching somewhere else this morning. He was one of our speakers. He kind of likes to go on and on and on. There's a starting time. There's a stopping time. Sometimes we talk about spending eternity. Hey, brother, where will you spend eternity? Let me tell you something. You can spend a lifetime. You can spend a dollar. But there's no way. There's no possible way that you can spend eternity. We, we sing songs about spending eternity. You can't spend eternity. Uh, sometimes we talk about living throughout eternity. You ever been asked that question? Roberta, where will you live throughout eternity? Well, you can live throughout a century. You can live throughout a lifetime, but you can't live. You can't live throughout eternity because eternity has no way. I started thinking about this as I studied for this class. What if I, by the grace of God, don't end up in heaven? What if I go to the other place? Uh, there is a place called hell. You ever heard a preacher talk about hell? Sometimes we, we don't talk much about hell anymore. But what if I end up in that bad place called hell? And let's say that hell is going to end after 100 years. Maybe I could bear it. Maybe I could stand it. After a day spent there, I could say, well, just 99 years and 364 more days, and I'm out of this place. Or let's say that I died and I go to hell. Let's say that hell is going to end after... 
a thousand years. Maybe I could bear it. Maybe I could stand it. After a day spent there, I could say, well, just 999 years and 364 more days, I'm leaving this place. Or, or, or let's say that hell is going to end after a million years. Maybe we could bear it. Maybe we could grit our spiritual teeth and hang in there. After a couple of days in hell, we could say, well, just 999,999 years and 363 more days, and I'm leaving this terrible, awful place. But no, sir, the Bible teaches that a man could go to hell and dwell for a hundred, a million, a billion, a trillion. What's after a trillion? A zillion? Is that, is, that, is that really a number, a zillion? I mean, you could go to hell and dwell for all of these years, and there would be no, no less days to spend because hell is forever and forever. And, well, what's true with the bad place? It's true the place that we're going to. It's true with the good place. It's true with heaven. Heaven is forever and forever and forever. It's permanent, everlasting life. You say, Keith, why do you want to go to heaven? i tell you why. It's a real place, a spiritual place. And it's a permanent place. Won't have to leave. God willing, I'll, I'll be leaving Washington tomorrow. Won't have to leave heaven. Let me give you another reason why I want to go. I want to go to heaven because uh, in heaven we'll be in the presence of God. Can you imagine in the presence of I know to a certain degree we have God's presence on earth. What did Jesus say? Where two or three are gathered together, my name, what? Matthew 18 and verse 20, I'm in, the pre I'm in the midst of them, right? Jesus is among us this morning. Have you seen Jesus? He's here. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Well, we had good numbers at the workshop this weekend. I, you know, I, I didn't know what to expect with this COVID thing and all. We, we had encouraging numbers. But I tell you, if only two or three were there, in his name, Jesus was there. Can you imagine being in the presence of God? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That where I am, Jesus said, where I am, hey, disciples, Christians, you can be there too. And you know, our Lord did not lie. He, he did go to prepare that place. He ascended into heaven, Acts 1, 9 through 11. You remember the story, the disciples are just looking up to heaven. And then I think about what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in about verse 16, for the Lord himself, who's coming, not some preacher, not some imposter, not a fake, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what place? Scripture says he's coming with a, Shout. You know, in churches of Christ, you don't want the preacher screaming, do you? You don't want the preacher getting up here and banging on the pulpit and yelling and raising his... Man, that sounds too denominational. That sounds too Pentecostal, right? I'm telling you, folks, Jesus, when Jesus comes, he's coming with a shout. Right? Oh, no. Oh, no. Scripture says he's coming with a shout, Right? Voice of the angel, trump of God, dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and the man shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? You know, there's not a verse in the book, not a one that ever indicates that Jesus is going to set foot on earth again. We're going to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be in his presence with the Lord. You know, when I get to heaven, I really expect to have full fellowship with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. I want to go to heaven to be with my Father. I talked about my Father yesterday, not my Father. I love my Daddy. My Daddy passed away about eight years ago. He was an elder of the church, great influence in my life. I miss him every day. But I'm not talking about my daddy. I'm talking about my father. I want to go to heaven and be with my heavenly father, our father who art in heaven. And I don't know if it's going to be possible, but it's possible to reach out and to hug him and to thank him and to say, 
thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. And I want to go to heaven to be with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that lives in this body, the Spirit, my brother, that lives in your body. And I don't know if it's going to be possible, but it's possible to reach out and to hug him and to thank him and to say, thank you, Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, for giving to me your mind, the mind of God through the Holy Book. And I want to go to heaven to be, be with my brother, my brother Jesus. And again, I don't know if it's going to be possible, but it's possible to reach out and to hug him and to thank him and to say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for bleeding. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for being buried, and thank you for being raised. And, and I would say, I would say what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, I'd rather be absent from this life. I'd rather be absent from this body to be at home with the Lord. You say, Keith, do you want to die? Do I want to die? I don't want to die. Death is an enemy. Uh, scripture says that death, I pray for safety. I want you to pray for my safety as I go home, to, home tomorrow. I don't want to die. You say, Keith, do you want Jesus to come? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let him come today. Say, I want to go home to be present in the presence of God. You say, Keith, why do you want to go to heaven? It's a place, a permanent place filled with the presence of God. I also want to go to heaven to be with the people of God. See, Jesus said, where I am to his disciples, you can be there too. First day of heaven, folks. First day of heaven. And here's a guy that's talking about being patient. I don't know if Job is going to be talking about patience in heaven. You know, in heaven, you won't need any patience. But here's a guy who's talking about patience. And we're thinking... You know, you, you kind of want to pinch yourself. Am I drink? Is this real? Is this Job in heaven? And, and then here's a fella, and he's talking about a boat that he built. Noah, it, 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 is it really you? Can you imagine being in heaven with Noah? Three guys talking about being thrown into a fire shed. Meshach and Abednego. Here's a guy talking about being thrown into the den of life. Daniel, can you imagine being in heaven with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Moses, you remember the story of Moses? God called Moses to lead his people out of bondage. Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. Remember? And what did Moses say? Moses takes off those shoes, right? You know what we would have done if we'd been there? You know what we would have said? Folks, I know. I've been to some of our church business meetings. Why? <laughs> How come? But not Moses. Moses just takes off those shoes. And the Bible says that uh, God used Moses to lead his people out of Egyptian slavery. Can you imagine in heaven with Moses? Paul, Peter, James, John. I tell you, being with these people, the people of the Bible, would mean more to me than being with any president of the United States. Being with these people would mean more to me than being with any movie star Hollywood has ever produced. Being with the saved of the Bible would be like getting on a train or a plane and going to a very distant city to be with friends. And that's really who they are, friends, the friends of God, the friends of the Bible. But I tell you, I not only want to be with the people that I currently know on earth, I want to be with the people, or I, I not only want to be with the people of the Bible, I want to be with the people that I currently know on earth. If you're a baptized believer, if you've been baptized into Jesus and you're walking in the light, you're headed to heaven, hey, I, I want to go to heaven to be with you. Bill, I want to go to heaven to be with you and your family. Bob, you and your family. Ken, you and your family. Alan, you and your family. You say, Keith, do you, do you really think we'll know each other in heaven? Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that the Bible teaches we'll know each other in heaven. You say, well, preacher, what if, what if 
we get to heaven and we look all over that pearly city and, and we check every apartment list and every mansion and, and we find out a loved one is missing. You ever been asked the question, hey, how can you be happy in heaven realizing that a loved one is, is not there? I don't know. I don't know. The best that I can offer is trust the promises of God. Because God said, in heaven with God himself, the presence of God and the people of God, we will be blessed. You say, Keith, why do you want to go to heaven? It's a place that is permanent, filled with the presence of God and the people of God. Let me give you one more reason why I want to go. I want to go to heaven because in heaven won't be any problem. No problem in heaven. You're in John 14. Look back to verse 1. Look back to verse 1. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Let me tell you what I wish, brothers and sisters. I wish that I could stand before this class and say, you know, if, you're just, if you'll just be faithful to God, if you'll just love Jesus, you're never going to have any problems. Uh, you're not going to have any financial problems or uh, health problems or relationship problems. If you'll just be fired up for Jesus, everything's going to be hunky-dory. You're never going to have any problems. I, I wish that I could tell you that. The opposite is true. Christians have problems. Would you agree with that? If you do not have any problems, would you, uh, would you stand up? We all have problems, wouldn't you agree? I tell you what's going to be a problem. I got some bad knees. I've been jogging too much. Been playing football too much back when I was a kid. I've gotten old. It's going to be a problem to get back up. <laughs> we all have problems. All of us have problems. In fact, didn't Jesus say two chapters later, John 16, 33, in the world there's going to be tribulation. I'm telling you folks, in heaven won't be any problems. You won't have to wear masks in heaven, my brother. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. Won't be any glasses in heaven. Not going to lose your hair in heaven. <laughs> no cancer in heaven. No surgeries. No cemeteries, no funerals. It's an honor to do somebody's funeral. I've done, I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of funerals. But could I be honest with you? I, I love to preach. I hope you know before the day is over, I love to preach, okay? Thank you for the invitation. But there are some things about preaching and, and, and the preacher's role that I like a little bit less than others. And one of the things that I like a little bit less than others is the preacher's role in a funeral. Sometimes, you know, you don't, you don't know what to say. What, what do you say when a friend that you love dies and he's outside of Christ? What do you say at a bad man's funeral, huh? Something, I don't know. I heard about uh, two guys. They were brothers. They were living in a little town. They were wicked through and through, mean, rascals, rotten, meanest guys you've ever seen. One, one day, one of these brothers died, and, and the brother, the living brother, went to the local preacher in this little town to get him to do his brother's funeral. And, and the preacher knew these guys, and he said, oh, I, I, I can't. And, and, and the brother said, well, I don't have anybody else to do my brother's funeral. You've got to do my brother's funeral. And the preacher said, I don't want to. The brother said, I'll pay you $1,000. The preacher said, when do you want it? <laughs> he said, why didn't you tell me it was one of those funerals? The brother said, I'll pay you $1,000 provided through this funeral service somewhere you refer to my dead brother as a saint. A saint, the preacher asked. He thought about that $1,000. He said, okay, okay, I'll do it. Well, the big day came. There was standing room only. I mean, word had gotten out all over this little town that somewhere during the service, the preacher was going to refer to the dead man as a saint. And the preacher got up, had a little Bible reading, had a little prayer, and then he started. He said, ladies and gentlemen, Lying before me was one of the meanest, the most unkind, the most inconsiderate men I've ever known. He was a rascal. He was rotten through and through. You knew him. But he said, compared to his brother out there in the audience, this guy was a saint. <laughs> what, 
what's the pre preacher going to say at your funeral, huh? You know, most, I tell you what we want. We want, most of the time, we want the preacher to get up and preach us into heaven, right? Let me tell you, folks, if you want the preacher to preach you into heaven, live so we can. Live so we can. And I don't know, see, in heaven won't be any death. And maybe one of the first things that we'll have to get used to in heaven will, Alan, Alan, I saw you a thousand years ago. You, you mean you're still here? You haven't died? And, and he looks back at me and says, yeah, you're, you're still here, kid. You, you haven't? And, and then we go our separate ways and we meet maybe 2,500 years later. And I say, Alan, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> And know, Alan says, Keith, you haven't changed a bit either. See, in heaven won't be any changes, no funerals, no cemeteries, no heartaches, no problem in heaven. In fact, John put it like this, Revelation 21 and verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. You say, Brother Keith, why do you want to go to heaven? I tell you why I want to go to heaven. It's a place that is permanent, filled with the presence of God and the people of God. And let not your heart be troubled. There won't be any troubles, no problems in heaven. About 20 years ago, back in the summer of 2001, my family and I set out on a 65-day uh, trip, 65-day vacation. I had gone to the leaders, the elders of our church about five years before, and I said, you know, five years from now, in the summer of 2001, my children are going to be 12 and 15 and 19. And, you know, I've been in ministry a long time. And brothers, what I would like to do, I said, you don't have to pay me for that summer, but what I would like to do, I would like to take a leave of absence from the ministry. I'd like to just break away in the summer of 2001 and kind of spend the summer with my family. Well, they thought about that. And, by their grace, they extended that blessing. Five years rolled around. We started saving some money. And on May the 28th of 2001, we set out on a 65-day trip. We drove 9,610 miles. We visited 22 states, went to eight national parks, parts like uh, Glacier National Park, beautiful place. In fact, we ended up coming to Seattle. We drove to Seattle, your area. We caught on a, we caught a boat, our, our very first cruise, and, and we went to Alaska. Enjoyed it so much. I've been to Alaska six times, three times to preach, been on three other or two other cruises, so three cruises and all. And we had a wonderful time, and just a great time in the summer of 2001. But I'll never forget on that, uh, on that 65th day, as our family drove from the state of Arkansas back into the state of Tennessee, we crossed the Mississippi River, and, and we saw the sign. Welcome to Tennessee. Tennessee welcomes you. My oldest daughter, 15 years old, spoke up from the back seat of the car. When she saw the sign, welcome to Tennessee, she spoke up and she said, Ah, it feels so good to be back home. And I quickly said to her on that occasion, Ashley, we ain't home yet. We ain't home yet. And I want to say to you, good people, we ain't home yet. I, I like your area. I like your weather, like the people. It's a beautiful place. But I'm telling you, folks, Puyallup is not home. Washington is not home, and Seattle is not home, and Tacoma is not home, and Tennessee is not home, Nashville's not home, Henderson, I live in, I've lived in Hendersonville for 30 years, the home of Johnny Cash, but I'm telling you, Hendersonville is not home. Our home is in heaven. So, my brother, my sister, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you can be there too. Let's pray together. Father, more than anything in the world, I want to go to heaven. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, your amazing grace, without which I have no hope. One day, Father, I want to go home. In Jesus' name, amen.